Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron, and if you haven't uh, seen one of these before, this is the seminar series that I have been doing um, across a lot of, of senior centers and other communities. Uh, but during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I can't do them at the senior center so that I've been doing them uh, virtually. And thank you to the cooperation to your local cable television station for, for their willingness to do these. So this seminar, I'm trying to do these monthly. And this seminar, it's the end of the year. And we want, I wanted to talk a little bit about gifting. Because tis the season. This is the time when people often think about gifting, both because it's Christmas and because it's the end of the tax year. And people often think they want to be doing some gifting at the end of the tax year. So I wanted to talk about kind of what gifting is, what the advantages are to it. With their, and there are a lot, actually. Um, what the disadvantages are, what the kind of traps are to the unwary, so that you just have a sense of what you can do, what you may want to do. So, um, you've often uh, seen me talk about my friends uh, Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., um, and their goal, which is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. So, in this presentation, uh, I'm assuming that Frank has died and that it is just Mary that we're talking about. And Mary is trying to figure out whether or not she wants to be making gifts to her children at any particular time. Right now, maybe because it's the end of the year, but just in general. And her estate plan following her, that is the plan following her death regarding how she wants her remaining assets to be divided, is very simple. She wants things divided equally among the three kids. So the question is, oh, and th these are Mary's assets. She has a house. She has an IRA, um, which has a current value of about $500,000. She has savings of about $300,000, and she has an annuity, um, which has about $300,000 in it. Therefore, her total assets are about $1,500,000. So the question for Mary is, is there any reason that she shouldn't simply be giving some things away now? Now, I know that Mary's first question is, well, wh I can't afford to give things away now. I might need them, and that is absolutely right. You don't ever want to be giving things away if giving things away is going to cause you to lose sleep. You know, they always often tell people the goal of life at our age is, is, you know, fame and fortune has kind of passed you by. The goal is to get a good night's sleep. So if this is going to bother you, you know, don't do it. But if you're considering gifting or if you're open to gifting, then you just want to kind of know kind of how the system works and what the implications are. <clears throat> First of all, you need to know what a gift is. I'll often uh, talk to people when I'm doing mass health related planning and say, well, you know, there are some gifting restrictions. Um, and they'll say, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give my child the car. I, I sold it to him for a dollar. Well, no, that's a gift. To, to have a gift, there needs to be, there need to be um, four things. There needs to be, first of all, it has to be a transfer for less than fair market value. That's the definition of a gift. Even if you say it's a sale, if it's for less than fair market value to the extent that the value is discounted, that's a gift. Uh, there needs to be donative intent. You need to be giving something to someone with the intention that you can't get it back. That's the whole idea legally is that once you've given it to someone, you can't therefore then later sue them and say, I want it back. Um, there needs to be delivery for that very reason so that it can be clear when a gift has really happened, there actually needs to be delivery of that gift. So if you say to your, one of your kids, I promise to give you $10,000, that's not binding. They can't later sue you for that and say, give me the $10,000. Until you've given it to them, they don't have it and it's not a gift. And there has to be acceptance. You think to yourself, well, that's a weird thing. Why, do I, why does there have to be acceptance on a gift? Well, maybe some, you, you're, you're thinking of giving somebody a gift that they really don't want. Uh, I often, when I used to do a lot of real estate work, would deal with gifts, quote unquote, of property, which were hazardous waste sites. Well, no, I, I don't want a hazardous waste site, so I wouldn't take it. Um, there are cases in which um, you might not want to accept a gift for, for tax purposes, although we're not going to talk about that today. So, so, it, so the issue is there has to be acceptance in order for the, there to be a valid gift. Now, the gift doesn't have to be to an individual. It can be to a nonprofit organization. It can be to a church. It can also be to an irrevocable trust, a trust for the benefit of some individuals. The word irrevocable means once you've put the money into the trust, you can't take it back out. And therefore, there's been delivery. It's just like a gift. Even if the children haven't received the money yet, the fact that it's in trust for their benefit and you don't have control over it, because if you did, well, then you could give it back to yourself and so there wouldn't, there wouldn't be an irrevocable trust. 
The very fact that you've given it away and can't get it back means there's been a gift. <clears throat> what are the tax implications of a gift? So everybody that I talk to says, oh, I can't, you know, I can't make a gift beyond a particular amount. And the amount that I usually hear is $15,000. Let me talk to you a little bit about, the, about the, 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 that. Um, because that's a myth. So the, the, the receipt, first of all, let me clear some things up. The receipt of a gift is not income. So whenever you're thinking about giving your kids some money, but you're saying, oh my God, aren't they going to have to report that as an income tax thing? Well, no, actually, receiving a gift, they, they haven't done work in, order to, in, in return for the money. Therefore, it isn't income to them. It's simply a gift, and that's not subject to income tax. There is no Massachusetts gift tax, and there is effectively no federal gift tax. Now, let me talk to you about this one because this is where that $15,000 figure comes in. The, the, while, while the state will allows you, or, or Massachusetts allows people to give away things literally the day before they die, thereby avoiding the estate tax, at the federal level, they wanted to plug that loophole. And so what they did was they created a federal combined estate and gift tax system. And they said, well, uh, when you die, if you, if you leave things to people over a particular amount, there's an estate tax. And then they said, if you give, them, give it away to them while you're, while you're alive, well, then there's a gift tax in order to make sure that the gifting doesn't simply avoid the estate tax. So the way that works is the minimum which is subject to the estate tax is if you give away, if you die, and you have an estate of worth something more, little, right now it's a little bit more than $14 million, then there is no estate tax. Um, um, if, you, if you give away more than $14 million, then there is an estate tax. The way the gift tax works is there is a federal gift tax. However, there are two big exclusions to that gift tax. One that everybody knows about and one that nobody knows about. The one that everybody knows about is that you're allowed to give any person in any year up to a particular amount of money. That amount used to be $10,000. Over time with inflation, it's grown, it's now $15,000. So that's the one that everybody knows about. The one that knows, nobody knows about is the second one. In addition to those gifts, in addition to those gifts, you're allowed to give over your lifetime a total of the same number that is the estate tax number, which is uh, right now a little over $14 million. So unless you, are, you, unless you have a tremendous amount of money, then no matter how much you give in gifts, there will never be a gift tax. But how about filing a gift tax return? You'll often find your accountant or others saying, well, you know, if you give over this $15,000 amount, you have to file a gift tax return. Now, technically that is true. There is a federal government requirement that you file the gift tax return. But I'm a lawyer, so my question whenever anybody tells me they have to do something is, well, what happens if you don't? Well, in this case, if you don't file a gift tax return and you made a gift of over $15,000 in a year to someone, the only penalty is a percentage of the tax that you would have owed if you had filed the gift tax return. But of course, if your accumulated lifetime gifts are under $14 million, there is no tax, which means there's no penalty if you don't file the gift tax return. So there's nothing bad about, uh, there's no taxable gift tax that you have to be worried about effectively unless you have total assets of more than, more than $14 million and that's a whole other conversation. So then the question is, are there other advantages to making these, to making gifts given the fact that now there is no disadvantage of give it, to giving in any particular amount? I'm gonna talk about four. First, I'm going to talk about the last one. One of the nice things about making a gift while you're alive, whether it's a gift of that, you know, your ring that you, you, the, you, know, that you really were going to give to your granddaughter anyway, the wedding ring, you know, or the tools or the guns that you were going to give your son or your grandson, you know, that you've had in the family for years, you get to hear him say thank you. So what's wrong with that? I often have that. I, I remember talking to clients they're older and, and their, their kids will come and visit them or their grandchildren say, oh, you know, Meme, that, or Grandma, that, that, I really love that, you know, particular thing on the, on the, yeah, I love that piece of jewelry, I love that. And literally they'll just give it to them. Say, here, take it. Oh, what a wonderful gift. You know, what a special thing around the holidays to be giving someone someone that you know that they would really like and that you want to give them after you die. So that's the first piece. There were three others, though, that I'm going to talk about more from a legal perspective. 
probate avoidance, estate tax avoidance, and mass health protection. First of all, probate avoidance. Remember now, Mary's estate plan is very simple. Once she dies, she wants to leave all the property to her three kids. But, the, but if she owns that property, if she owns that asset at the moment of she, that she dies, if she owns the house, for example, before that house can be given to the three kids, that asset has to go through the probate process. The same would apply to her savings accounts. Probably not her annuity or her IRA. As long as she's named death beneficiaries on those, those assets won't going to, aren't going to have to go through probate, but the others are if she dies owning them. Now, she may not want to be, you know, wanting to give those assets away today because like she's living in the house, you know, and she might and she's thinking, you know, what if I need that money? And that all makes perfect sense. But what she may want to do regarding the house, she may want to say, well, I really only want the house until I die. After I die, you know, I'll be buried in the backyard, but I'm not going to need the house, right? So she may want to consider giving away a so-called remainder interest in the house. That is ownership in the house the moment that she dies, while keeping something called a life estate in the house. That is total control until she dies. If she does that, then she keeps total control while she's alive. If, she, if she's renting the house, that's okay. She gets the rent. You know, she still has to pay the taxes and the insurance. No one can throw her out. But at the moment of her death, her interest evaporates. Her kids become the sole owners of the house. It doesn't go through probate. Same thing with cash, she, or, or, or there is a, a similar process for cash. The easiest device is to actually create the, a, a joint accounts with your children with the, for the cash so that you own the cash jointly with them. The legal consequence of that is that when you die, your interest evaporates, your kids become the sole owners of the cash, the money doesn't have to go through probate. Now, you may have some concerns about both of those alternatives. Um, there are some issues with giving away a remainder interest in the house. Uh, if you later say that, decide that you want to sell the house, that means the kids need to give you back their remainder interest before you can sell it. Um, and you may be concerned about that, right? If you need to mortgage the house, you may need their consent to that mortgage. So there may be, you need to, you want to talk this out before you do it. But the main thing is, if you do it, that avoids probate. Another possibility is to keep control of your assets, leave them in your name, but have a power of attorney and have a power of attorney that has the gifting, gifting powers in it that specifically says that the person whom you've named as your attorney can make gifts on your behalf and then tell that person or even better put something in writing to that person that says to that person you know before I die if it if it's clear that I'm going to be dying soon right give those things away sign the deed on my behalf giving this remainder interest to the kids so that when I die they become the sole owners take the cash keep whatever is going to be needed to bury me to take care of other things Give the rest of it away. And, 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 and if your power of attorney, if you're the person with your power of attorney does that, the day before you die, probate is avoided completely, as long as they've given away everything. You want to make sure you haven't left anything behind that's going to be that's going to require a probate. Finally, if you want to be on the safe side, especially if the distributions that you're making are unequal. I have a situation that I'm working on right now for a for a, uh, a family where, where the dad really wants to give everything to the daughter, to one daughter, because the other daughter's husband died fairly recently, and left a lot of money to the other daughter, so she, he, felt, he feels that's only fair, and this one daughter has been taking care of her, the one he's leaving things to. My suggestion to them was, you, you just do everything you can to avoid probate, but you may even want to put something in your will, change your will, so that if probate ever happens, you've made it clear in the will that everything was going to be going to this one daughter. That way, the daughter who is the other daughter who may be pretty upset about this, right, won't think that by forcing a probate of the will, she can end up getting the assets. But the main thing is you can make that, do that kind of planning ahead of time. Second, there's estate tax avoidance. Um, let me talk to you, to understand that, you need to understand the estate tax a little bit. This is the Massachusetts estate tax. Remember, the federal estate tax is irrelevant to you. Remember the assets that Mary had, they have a total value of $1,500,000. If she were to die tomorrow with those assets, there would be a Massachusetts estate tax of, of $68,240. Now that's not a huge amount, 
but you hate to you know, spend it for no good reason if you don't have to. So uh, maybe to the extent that Mary wants to avoid that estate tax, she wants to think about how can she do that? Well, if Mary gives all of her assets away the day before she dies, her estate goes down to zero. And therefore, the estate tax goes down to zero. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Unless there are some other reasons to not be making some of those gifts. So I just want to talk about those, the, t the potential tax disadvantages. First of all, before Mary could give away the money in her IRA, she would have to cash it in. And, and she'd have to pay the tax on the money in the IRA. If she cashed, and remember from the, from, from, the, uh, from the list of Mary's assets, her IRA is worth about $500,000. If we're estimating that the total um, <clears throat> Massachusetts and federal estate or income tax on that money would be about $30,000, that means the income tax that would have to be paid would be $150,000. Obviously, that's a lot more than the $68,000 she's paying in estate tax. Now, remember though, that the income tax is going to have to be paid sooner or later. Uh, whenever Mary, Mary get, Mary's kids get the money, even if they take the money over, their, over the next 10 years, which they're allowed to do. But it may, and it may very well be that the tax on that money, when they pay it, is going to be higher than Mary's tax, because they're probably going to be in a higher income tax bracket because they're still earning money. So the main thing to do regarding this kind of problem is, you need, this is a math problem. And so you need somebody who's used to doing that kind of math. That is, your accountant. Do the math, talk to your accountant. But if this works out right, you want to, once again, the person with your power of attorney has the ability to do this for you, literally the day before you die. You want to try to figure this out and find out whether that would be worthwhile as a strategy. Finally, giving away the house. Um, the problem with giving away the house is the capital gains tax. You need, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Though, if Mary and, and Frank dot, bought their house a long time ago for $50,000, um, for tax purposes, they each got a tax basis of $25,000 in the property for a total basis of 50. dollars That was their purchase price. If they, were to, if they had, bought, had sold the house for $400,000, which is its current value, there would have been a capital gain equal to $400,000 minus that $50,000, or about $350,000. They wouldn't have paid a capital gains tax because they were living in the house, so there's, a, there's an exclusion for them. But the point is, that's how the capital gain would have been figured. At the moment that Frank died, if you assume that, Frank, that the house at the, mo at the moment of his death was worth $300,000, his basis and his piece of the property jumped to the date of death value, so which is ha half of the total value, which would have been $150,000, leaving Mary with a basis of $150,000 plus her original $25,000 basis of, or $175,000. If Mary gives away the house the day before she dies, she is giving away the, her basis in the house also, that $175,000. When the kids go to sell the house for $400,000, they're going to pay a capital gains tax on the difference. The difference is $225,000. The capital gains tax, in that case, I'm estimating here, it would be about 20% of that number, or about $45,000. That's a significant bill. What happens if Mary simply owns the house at the time of her death? In that case, at the moment of her death, just like what happened in Frank's case, the basis of the house, her basis of the house, jumps to the date of death value, which in this case would be $400,000. If the kids sell the house, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. decide to then sell the house the day after she dies, they pay zero in capital gains tax. So it may very well be that the, the estate tax disadvantage of keeping the house in the estate gets outweighed by the capital gains advantage if the kids plan on selling the house after Mary dies. Now remember, they may not be going to sell the house, or it may be that one of the kids lives in the house, so that if that, that child sells the house, they're going to be able to get that capital gains exclusion because they're an owner-occupant. Once again, these are math problems, right, that have a significant effect on you and will on your kids. So the answer to this is, talk to your accountant to figure this out. So now I'm gonna go back and talk about some possible um, solutions for Mary if she's in these situations. So first, there's, there, remember these are Mary's assets. She's got a house, it's worth $400,000. She's got an IRA, 
worth um, $500,000. She has savings worth $300,000. And she has that annuity, and the annuity is also worth $300,000. So, and she's thinking about this. She's saying, well, what if I make these, get, try to make these gifts in order to avoid some of this estate tax? Solution number one is fairly straightforward. Mary decides after talking to her accountant that it really is, makes more sense for her to keep those assets in her estate because the, the tax hit is, uh, uh, if, the, if the capital gains or the income tax hit is greater than the estate tax savings was. So she keeps those two assets. Those two assets together were worth $900,000. Remember the total assets were a million five. She takes the rest and she gives them away. By giving them away, she has reduced her taxable estate to $900,000. She has therefore reduced her estate tax to only $30,960, a substantial drop, right? But what if Mary said, no, you know, I really want to get rid of all of my estate tax. I really want to reduce my estate tax to zero, right? Well, that's more challenging, but there is a way to do it. And that goes back to the magic $15,000 rule. There is only one case in which th this notion of giving away in increments of $15,000 or less affects Mary. If she gives away some, some or all of her remaining funds in increments of $15,000 or less to individuals in one year, no more than $15,000 per person per year, then those amounts actually um, get, get subtracted from her estate of figuring out, for, for purposes of figuring out whether she's entitled to the magic million dollar rule. The rule in Massachusetts is if you have a total est taxable estate of a million dollars or less, you, you do not have to pay any estate tax. But if Mary's assets are greater than a million dollars, the only way she can reduce those assets to a million dollars or less is by giving them away in increments of $15,000 per, per year per, per person. Now, she could give all kinds of money away if she were giving, them away to not, if giving it away to not only her kids, but maybe her grandchildren. There may be ways of doing this. The point is there, there is a strategy that would allow Mary to, to save on the capital gains tax, save on the income tax, and also avoid the estate tax. But for Mary to do that, she can't give all of her assets away um, just before she dies. It's going to take some time before, b because it's going to take her several years for her to take $500,000 and give it away in increments of $15,000 per person per year. That's going to, just going to take her more time. So the bottom, the bottom line though is, when, when Mary is thinking about these estate tax issues, she wants to remember a couple of things. First of all, which is obvious, the estate tax reduction is never going to affect her. She's going to be dead. The only question is, does she, to what extent does she want to increase the amount that's going to end up going to her children and reduce the amount that's going to go to the IRS or to the Department of Revenue? I often tell people when they're, when they're doing their estate plans, I, I've yet to find a couple that puts into their will, oh, I really want to leave some money to the IRS. I mean, they've been so good to me, you know, or the Department of Revenue. So, but they are automatically part of your estate plan unless you're, taking these, unless you're facing up to these problems and trying to deal with these solutions. So Mary just wants to balance that out. She wants to talk to her kids. She wants to know, once again, because this money isn't for her. This is just for her kids. She wants to know that she's not losing sleep during the rest of her life just in order to slightly increase the amount of money that's going to her kids. But given all of that, right, she wants to figure all of those things out. Finally, there's mass health protection. Often, seniors will come to me and say that the reason why they want to talk to me um, is they're trying to preserve assets for their kids, um, and they know that if they need nursing home care and therefore need to qualify for mass health, they're going to have to give these. They're going to have to spend all the money down on the nursing home. The answer to that problem is fairly simple. If they want to protect their assets so that when the assets, if Mary wants to protect her assets so that when the assets aren't counted when she is trying to qualify for mass health, because remember to qualify for mass health, she needs to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, then, then the solution is she's got to give some things away. She's got to give a lot of things away. So remember, these are her assets and they have a total value of $1,500,000. Now, 
Mary can own her house at the time that she tries to apply for MassHealth and still qualify. However, MassHealth will then put a lien on her house in order to get reimbursed following her death for any payments made on her behalf. Regarding all the other assets, though, before Mary could qualify for MassHealth, she'd have to cash them in and spend the assets down to less than $2,000. So to the extent that she's trying to avoid that, her options are pretty straightforward. She has to give the assets away. Remember, that means she has to give them away in a way that she can't get them back, right? To one or more of her kids or to anybody else for that matter. I know people who have given assets away to their church. Um, and then she has to wait five years. Five years and a day after the day on which Mary has given away her assets, those assets will no longer be countable or lienable if Mary needs to qualify for mass health. Now, she can give the assets away to individuals or she can give them away to an irrevocable trust. Remember we talked about an irrevocable trust means a trust from which she can't get the assets back after she's put them in. Typically that trust will name her, her most trusted child as her trustee. As I always tell people, that's why they call them trusts. You have to trust the trustee. Typically that trust will say that the trustee has the option of distributing some assets um, during Mary's lifetime with the unwritten provision being that Mary trusts that if she needs some of these assets, that that person, that daughter or son as the trustee will give the assets to himself or herself and then turn around and give them back to Mary or use them for Mary's, on Mary's behalf. Because remember, there's no gift tax. There's no bad tax implication to any of that. The trust will then say though, that following Mary's death, all the assets will be, will, will be liquidated turned into money and the assets divided into cash. If you have someone you trust, then these strategies make perfect sense for asset protection purposes. Remember though, the goal of your life is to get a good night's sleep. If, you don't, if there isn't somebody that you trust, you don't wanna lose sleep for the rest of your life just against this possibility that you might need nursing home care at the, at, eventually. So, the bottom line is there are a number of reasons why you maybe wanna want to consider gifting, you may have been surprised to find out that there's really no disadvantage to doing gifting. It's just a matter of kind of weighing things out. If you have more questions, you know, you can, you can, you can find this um, presentation on our YouTube ch on ch channel or on Facebook, or you can call me at 508-860-1470. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We'll look forward to, to, uh, to talking to you during the next seminar. Thank you.